Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hello, a special and edition. Welcome to Hello, a special and edition. Welcome to Hello, a special edition. Sorry about that. Still had a uh, still had a, a monitor on. Got it off now. So <laughs> start again. Hello, everybody, yeah. and welcome to a special edition of Telescope Talk. My name is Tony Darnell from DeepAstronomy.Space. We were going to have this conversation with uh, my guest today, D uh, Dustin Gibson from the Oceanside Photo and Telescope, but he is in the middle of doing a big move on his uh, business, and so we decided to do it today. So let me go ahead and bring up Dustin. Uh, hi, Dustin. Hey, Tony. Hey. This is exciting stuff. I know. So, lots going to happen in this Hangout, folks. First of all, I want to introduce uh, my new partner. Uh, we're partnering up to do a lot of really cool, what we hope to be some really cool content together. And Oceanside Photo and Telescope has been around for a long time, and I'm going to let Dustin introduce it, but they re the, the, now they're being called OPT, but they are one of the premier uh, places to purchase uh, astronomy, amateur astronomy equipment, and I want to, and I'm so thrilled to be able to work with someone like this, not, for, not the least of which has to do with telescope talk, but also just to help give people a proper introduction into the hobby of amateur astronomy. So uh, let me introduce, so this, like I said, this is Dustin Gibson of uh, OPT, and uh, why don't you just introduce yourself, Dustin? Yeah, yeah. So I'm one of uh, the two owners here at Oceanside Photo and Telescope. And uh, we are, as you mentioned, in the middle of a huge move right now. So all of us around here are just kind of running chaotically trying to get things done, including the studio, which was put together about 12 hours ago. You know, so um, I mean, we're, tr we're trying to keep it together, but it's been a big move for us. And it's, um, yeah, like you said, it's a company that's been around a long time, 72 years this year. This is the first time in those 72 years that we've had a move of this scale. We've moved the entire business to Carlsbad. And so, I mean, even outside my windows here, I'm just seeing people running back and forth trying to get everything <laughs> together in time. But no, we've got a lot of exciting stuff you and I have been talking about. I'm excited to share some of that today. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, I just got to ask, so in the course of this move, 70-year-old business, did you run across... Yeah. Maybe you're still unpacking boxes. I don't know. But did you run across any right. like really old vintage, vintage telescopes, maybe stuck in the quarter somewhere, gathering dust, like an old cave Astrola or <laughs> maybe an old RV6 Criterion or something like that? Yeah. Did you have anything like that? And run across anything cool like that in your move? You know, I'm kind of getting in the way because I've been going through a lot of the boxes as we find them, especially the old boxes, <laughs> because we did. We had an entire warehouse of stuff that, I mean, hasn't been opened in decades. And so we actually do. We have one scope here that's on display that is from 1947, which is the year. I mean, it was handmade in 47, which is the year OPT was started as Oceanside Photographic Center. So we put that right front and center. When you walk in, you can see this thing. It's amazing, you know. Um, but it still works. The motors, everything still work. And yeah, we're finding all kinds of little gems. But I mean, you got a building full of telescope junkies, you know. So every box we open, we're all like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the greatest box, you know. Well, that's what's cool about telescopes, though, isn't it, Dustin? I mean, they yeah. don't wear out. You get a telescope. I mean, the optical, tr the optics, uh, the way they're 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 either manufactured or ground or whether this refractor or reflector. Right. They don't have moving parts that just wear out. So if you get a really good optical lens or a mirror, the only thing that really changed over the years was the coatings, right? I mean, the kinds of things right. that you can put on the glass, like low yeah, transmission, exactly. low, you know, high reflectivity coatings, things like that. Yeah, and if, if it had good optics to begin with, you know, the right shape even, you know, you take these things and even just get them recoded, you've still got a beautiful, you know, amazing telescope today for some of these scopes that are 100 years old. So, yeah, you're exactly right. And uh, there's just something nice about these classic scopes, too, that I feel like everybody that's in astronomy, you always hear it or you see one at the star party, you know, and it's just when you come across one, it's just a gem like that. There's just something about it that's, that's hard to let go of. Right, and we are uh, so we are streaming this live on YouTube, Twitter, uh, Twitch, and uh, uh, Facebook, 
and I ho I'm monitoring all of those platforms. So I hope you'll ask us questions as we go along here on our little hangout. I also have a Discord server that is the link to that is in the description box, so you can click on that. And I'm and uh, I'm looking at that as well. So ask us questions. Talk. Let's talk. Let's talk about telescopes and amateur astronomy for the next hour or so. And in the and uh, Dustin and I are also going to talk about some things that we would like to do together to perhaps uh, get you more interested in amateur astronomy and and. One thing I will say in this discussion about the old telescopes is that, is that that's a really good excuse, a really good reason to buy the uh, an above average telescope if you can afford it, one with good optics. Yeah. Uh, optics, I think, would be more important than mounts only because they stand the test of time. You'll still be able to use that telescope a decade from now, two decades from sure. now. And so yeah. they really are a good value. It's not like a computer where you buy a computer and, uh, you know, you have to get the new update in a couple of years or three years after you buy it. Um, although, right. I will ask you this, Dustin. What about the new go-to telescopes? They're, a lot of these new scopes are basically computers, aren't they? I mean, they, they have a lot of software on them. Do, they, do you think they would stand the test of time? Yeah, I mean, it's so yes and no. I mean, a lot of the uh, it's like it's kind of like you're saying, if you're buying an above average, I call it the frustration curve. You know, people that buy above that frustration curve, yeah, I mean, these mounts will last people for you know a dozen years, uh, or more. A lot of these mounts are running you know 20, 30 years. We're seeing with some of these things, and like I said, I mean, I've got a mount in there, an equatorial mount on that 1947 scope that still works beautifully. So, but it's not uh, yeah. go to, and it doesn't have software and all of that other right, stuff. Right, right. You're right. You're right. It's a simple version of what's out today. But a lot of these things, I mean, you know, we so we have several different departments of OPT, and one of those departments is our professional services division. And so we sell to everyone. We sell to governments all around the world: NASA, JPL, Harvard, MIT, all of them. Right. If you can think of it, we sell to them. And so a lot of the mounts they're they're buying, they're not necessarily expensive. Um, especially when you consider the work they're doing, but these things they're buying them with the intention of using them all night, every night for, you know, 15 years, knowing this mount is going to work and we never see anybody complain. I mean, in the time here, I've never heard one person call and say, Hey, that mount that we bought gave up on me, you know, and these, these mounts started, you know, $2,000 plus. It's not like you got to go in and spend 50 K on a mount. Now, were these were these the kind of mounts that had go to capability? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. So in the go to, I mean, the technology and I definitely want to get into this as, as we go on. But the technology is so advanced. It's, I mean, it's in astronomy. It's no different than what we're doing right now. I mean, look at you're in Florida. I'm here on the beach in California, right on the opposite ends of the, the country. And we're communicating all this stuff uh, effortlessly. And it's the same thing with astronomy. I mean, even in the last five years, it went from where, you know, photography was this incredibly difficult thing. You had to have all of this equipment to now, you know, you've got single boxes this size that run an entire observatory automated all night long with, um, you know, all the gear you can possibly imagine. And uh, very, very simple for users to figure out. I mean, you can dive right in now. And even light pollution is no longer the problem it was. It's just these technological leaps have made things very simple. Right. Now, I'm reading the comments as you're talking, and Galaxia wants to know sure. where your shop's located, the new one. Now, we Galaxia, in, I should mention, is in Europe, so she's, okay. she, yeah, we have a lot of European it's a, viewers. It's a long hike from Europe, but we are in, <laughs> uh, in Carlsbad, California, right here on the beach. I mean, we're a couple miles from the beach. But you were telling me when I first talked to you on the phone that uh -huh. you are – a, did you say you were the, the number one supplier of telescopes worldwide? Yeah, yeah, we are. So it started, uh, like I said, 72 years ago as a really small camera store. And uh, when I say small, I mean tiny. Think like Radio Shack and then cut it in half, you know, um, for a single store. And they were basically just doing for, because this is a, a Marine base is right next door. They were just doing photographs for Marines and, and that type of thing. Um, but slowly we uh, started bringing telescopes in and it just kind of took off you know there wasn't really a place that was doing it on that level really supplying telescopes out there and educating people about it and then it got online and it just blew up so it very quickly became the largest in the country and over the last couple years it's grown into the largest in the world at what we do and so again and that's why we're supplying both the amateurs and the professionals at this point 
Okay, now one of the things that uh, we're going to be doing together, folks, is um, I believe we're, we're, we're this is this hangout in particular is kind of a practice for us because we're going to be starting a podcast together. We're still working out the details of what that podcast will be. And I right. would like we would like your input now. So please leave some comments and questions or comments in the live chat. We know there are at least I know there are several really good astronomy based podcasts out there. But what would you like specifically to know about or what kind of a podcast do you think would be particularly interesting to you and let us know because now's the time when we're planning this out and also uh, we're going to be talking about things like frequency how often we're going to be recording and things like that so um, that's one of the things that we're that we're going to be doing so leave us some uh, input on what you think you'd like to see uh, in a podcast now uh, Dustin when it comes to buying a telescope somebody who's never bought one before uh -huh. And how, uh, since you're a retailer and you sell to people for, to all over the world, sure. how important is it, do you think, for a beginner to be able to get support? And, and is it easy to get? I mean, let's say that you, they, they buy a telescope from you and then they start having trouble. Um, how, how, first of all, what percentage of your customers would you say come back with, with lots of questions and need help? Uh, or are the telescopes pretty self-explanatory and able to be used pretty much out of the box? What's your experience with that? So it's actually one of the reasons we bought the company is I just felt like this this entire industry has been so underserved for a very long time and not because anybody's intentionally making it that way, but it's just the complexity of astronomy is very, it's overwhelming at first. You know, when you're jumping in, just learning the night sky is a task and a half, right? But then when you start thinking about, like you were talking about the different optical assemblies and, and the different ways that you can organize an entire system, it's it's a lot to take in and it's very easy to get something wrong. And unfortunately with astronomy, getting something wrong, a lot like photography, means you're spending unnecessary money and time and frustration. And so, I mean, it's, it's critical. It's absolutely critical that people have a place where they can go and get the answers beforehand to not get uh, get tied up and ended up buying the telescope. We call them closet telescopes because that's exactly what happens. But, right. you know, people go, they buy the, the $40 telescope. And uh, even though the optics may work to see the moon or whatever it is, you know, if the mount is too confusing or if just there's no way to understand how the thing operates in the first place, it's not intuitive. Things like equatorial mounting, they're not intuitive. And so you really have to kind of have some resource, whether it be a club or videos or something out there to say, this doesn't have to be complicated. This is how the system works. And people get it every time. You know, once there's a way to see it in action, it makes a lot of sense. But if you don't have that, I mean, it's shooting in the dark. You know? Yeah. And so for someone like Galaxia, who may be in Europe and looking uh, to get a telescope, how does that work with you guys? I mean, uh, you, you go to the website, you place an order, but you guys ship worldwide, right? And then you pe people can follow up with with questions and comments or help get help from your staff. So there's a lot of different ways it works. But yes, we have so with the different departments, those types of calls are going to go to we have a general sales team here and they are trained. There's, you know, a lot of questions that beginners get asked because we want to make sure there's so many different directions you can take when getting into the hobby. You know, specifically, you know, the, the two big ones are people generally ask uh, photography or visual. And you can absolutely do both. But more people than you'd, you'd think are one hardcore one way or the other. I just want to do visual or I just want to do photography. And there's very different systems available if that's the case. So they ask a ton of questions trying to really get to the root of what's what the, you know, the person's trying to achieve. And then we can better guide them to, you know, the, the telescope solution that's going to make sense for that. But even before that, we have free resources on our website that we try to get out ahead of the problem. And then we call it OPTV. Uh, it's on YouTube as well. But what it is, is it's like we have a beginner telescopes video and it lays out with graphics every type of telescope design and what the benefits and what some of the drawbacks of each design are. And so it's worth taking, you know, two minutes to watch a video like that before jumping in and spending three or $400 or more, uh, knowing exactly what you're getting into. And more importantly, why now there's yes. And, and, the the, the name of the channel is OPT it's, it's here on YouTube and it's OPT, uh, telescopes i believe right isn't that the name right. of this channel yeah. so yes, uh, yes and i've linked to it on my channel so you can get there from my channel if you don't know where it is so 
right. Um, uh, okay. well, we're going to do a lot more of those, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's part of the plan. We're going to do a lot more of those videos. I feel like that helps tremendously. Yeah, yeah. So I'll be, yeah. And I think I'm going to be doing some, right? Some uh, some how-to videos on how yeah, to use absolutely. various telescopes. So I'm hoping, right. Dustin, that I'm going to get access to some equipment too that I can like do some how-tos and and not just how-tos, but you know, uh, direct reviews of different products as well too. I mean, I'd love to be able to do that if that's possible. So. Yeah, absolutely. I think it makes a lot of sense. And even just reports, because, you know, I, I don't like the, the words like telescope reviews, because the truth is, I mean, I see every telescope that's in existence coming through here every day. And anymore, the quality is so good on everything that it's not like we're going to have something come through where I'm just like, oh, that's a horrible <laughs> something. You know, there, I, I wouldn't say there's anything one star being produced in this industry right now. That's that's the benefit of being in an industry where it attracts, you know, I'd imagine everybody listening to this right now is just like everybody working here, everybody, you know, that's that takes part in what you do. Uh, it just attracts hyper intelligent people into this, you know, into this hobby. And uh, that's one of the benefits is it's the same thing with the manufacturers. They're creating these unbelievable products. And so, yeah, I mean, we're, we're doing the same thing, just trying to get reports out there. and like, hey, this is the new innovative thing. That's... And I brought some stuff with me to show you. Oh, you did. Cool. What'd you bring? I did. Uh, well, I mean, why don't we just kind of dive right Let's in, right? We got, uh, so the first thing Let is, make, um, make. <laughs> Go ahead. we've got, uh, so, you know, one of the things we should talk about is some of the things we have coming up, right? We have a lot of really exciting things, but we can skip ahead to one of them, which is a documentary that we're going to be shooting on astrophotography with Steven Swancote. And, uh, this is super exciting. Uh, we're all astrophotography nuts here. Uh, we spend all of our time doing it. We have a website called everyclearnight.com uh, that we let people upload their own photos. We upload our photos there, and it's just what all of us here spend our time doing when we're not here. But for that documentary, we put a scope together, and we've got the camera just came in, and the whole thing's coming together. But when we're talking about telescopes, this is a— Takahashi. I see it yeah, already. Takahashi. With a you know a very important Carl Sagan here on the side, right? <laughs> Look and, at that! Yeah. That's awesome. It and comes that, it side, comes that way. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, I knew I'd be traveling. I've got to be in sixteen countries in the next twenty four months. So this is going to be my baby traveling oh, okay. with for that. So I I decorated it a little bit. Oh, okay, you know? it's got some got but, some uh, bling on it. Well, what is but, that? Yeah. What, what is uh, that? A, is that a refractor? It is. So it's an apochromatic refractor. This is what I'll be using for a lot of the images I'll be posting. But um, yeah, these small systems, it's, it's kind of the opposite. I know that the first thing you see when you look at visual astronomy is everybody says aperture is king. You know, the, the bigger the scope, the more you're going to see, which is true. But with photography, it's not necessarily as important for what most amateurs are trying to do. For science, it's still critical on a lot of elements. But um, for photography, I use really small systems all the time, and this will be my workhorse, this tiny scope. I mean, you see how small it is. It's, it's not a big system at all. It's very light. It's portable. I can carry it on planes with me. And, um, you know, a lot of the images I post oh, to that website, you know, that's the kind of scopes that I'm shooting them with. You want that short focal link to get a big, you know, wide field of view. Uh, so you can see more of the context of what's around the target instead of just the target itself. Right. You can kind of see its place in space. If that makes sense. Yeah. So that so that's a wide field uh, refractor then. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so, yeah, I mean, it's kind of the difference. Wide field just being like, say you had an image and the moon was what you were shooting. So two different telescopes. One, when they say long focal length, the moon would fill up your whole field of view. Everything that you see in the image would be just the moon with the long focal length. And then something like this would have you know enough room in the image for maybe 12 moons right so it'd be very small in the view but um you know you can get larger targets that way targets like andromeda right the galaxy that's so many i think it's what six six spans of moon across mm -hmm. yep yeah uh, like so six, yeah about yeah. six degrees i think so yeah, yeah. so uh larry keys is commenting uh where were you when my son and i spent 10 large what did you spend 10 large on, Larry Keys? <laughs> That's what I want to know. Uh, 10 large. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, here you go. Oh, he, he comments earlier. I purchased a 12-inch Mead RC scope just before Mead removed the RC. 
Uh, right. Is it now? It is now a closet scope. We placed a wedge on the Althaz, uh, and now we can't move it. Am I beyond help and just sell it or what? Yeah. So there's a couple of th different things you can do. Um, one of the things we offer is a buyback program where anything you have telescope related, cameras, telescopes, adapters, focusers, whatever it is, you can box it up and ship it to us. And we take that stuff in for credit or for cash all the time. I mean, we have a department that's all they do. They're taking in dozens of boxes every day of just the stuff that people want to trade up towards new gear or if they just want to sell it and be done with it right we usually hope that people aren't getting out of the hobby we need more people to share this with but um you know either way it works and you can absolutely send it in and put it towards something new something if you want a short focal length scope like we're talking about wide field or if you just need help with um you know trying to get it working again you can absolutely call us our tech support will uh will help walk you through what's necessary to get that thing running in out of the closet what's an rc scope do you know uh richie creations oh so got it oh thank you yeah. okay sure sure yeah well i don't Purely understand reflective. how putting an out as or putting a wedge on that makes you so you can't move it i don't i don't get that but anyway i'd have to see a picture larry that's uh, yeah it that, should just make it EQ, you know, it should just make it equatorial so yeah. that you can track and do longer exposures without rotation in the image. Or maybe he means it's too heavy or something. I'm not sure, but, uh, <laughs> it probably sounds heavy. Yeah. Well, that's an well, issue, man. isn't it? I mean, you, you're able to <laughs> take your Takahashi with you and lift it up in one hand. Right. And uh, yeah. if you spend, uh, what was it? 12, what'd you say? Seven, 10 large, $10,000 on a, on a computer, on a telescope. Um, it right. might be heavy, might not be portable. Uh, and you might be thinking to yourself, boy, it's sitting in my sitting in my uh, closet today. Do it's really clear out. I want to go out and observe, but now I've got to spend two hours lugging a seventy or eighty pound telescope outside and polar right. aligning it. Now nah, just stay inside and watch TV. Um, yeah, and it's it's amazing because it's really not you know big scopes are fun. I mean, my other scope is a seventeen inch plane wave out in my observatory. It's huge. I would never try to carry it anywhere. But, you know, it's, I mean, it's monstrous. Uh, and that's really fun for trying to get those high res tight shots of targets. But the truth is you don't need a huge system to do phenomenal photography. Arguably one of the best photographers in the world, astrophotographers in the world would be uh, one of the guys that actually the guy that manages our professional services. So all he does is set up systems for NASA, JPL and the like. And uh, the telescope he uses most of the time is a $800 APO refractor that's the size of a can of tennis balls. And if you look at his photography, I mean, it is some of the best imaging in the world. And he's using a system that weighs a couple pounds, you know. That's right. So it's not what you got. It's what you do with it a lot of times as well. Exactly. So, yeah. People yeah. overcomplicate it a lot. And it costs a lot of money to do that. And uh, it gets very heavy very quickly. Well, with imaging, you can get away with smaller apertures because you can Absolutely. adjust things like exposure times and, and things like, and, and image processing can show you detail that you would never get. Uh, well, equivalent detail. Let's say you're using a six inch telescope. You got a really good uh, imaging setup. You could probably... I would say get the same amount of images of, I don't know, Mars or Jupiter out of something like that, that you could with a very, very large uh, aperture reflector because you can, you can play around with your exposure times and you can also play around with it uh, after the fact in Photoshop. But uh, if you want good, bright images with your eyeball, then, you know, really aperture is, is still king, I think. That's well, my let's, opinion. Let's talk about why that is for a second, right? I mean, if you think about the difference in a camera and your eye and what's happening, if you're looking at, say, the Veil Nebula or anything in, in deep space, you know, these really, really faint things. Think about this. Your eye is basically refreshing 60 times a second. Whereas, so your exposure for your eye, we could call one sixtieth of a second. And so you have to have a huge lens to be able to pull in enough light in one sixtieth of a second to see anything. And so with a camera, some of the exposures, like I just did a 90 hour exposure on the Helix Nebula. So compare how much light we're gathering in one sixtieth of a second compared to five minutes even or 90 hours or when you have complete control of collecting light for as long as you want and that's the huge difference so the scope has to be bigger visually than it ever does for photography 
And the reason you had such a long exposure, why did you, why did you, and you obviously can't do that on one time, right? You've got to do it over the course of a long time. Right. So that why, why such a long exposure? A Why'd you do that? I just wanted to see, so the Helix Nebula is the one that looks like uh, the giant eyeball out in space. And it's one I've always wanted to shoot. And I just never had gotten around to it. And so um, when I finally did get around to it, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take the longest exposure I ever have on any target and really just see what's there. Uh, most of my exposures are between 30 and 40 hours. Um, but this was, yeah, I spent, spent 90 hours on this one. And uh, there's a lot there. You can, you can definitely see some stuff. Yeah, okay. Well, uh uh, uh, Peter Peter Q is commenting that the ISS is due over England in five minutes. Go outside, Peter. Look at the yes. ISS and then get your butt back in here. I I admit it's pretty cool. Um, I at the only place I've ever seen the ISS, by the way, is in England. I, it doesn't come over my area of the woods all that much. So uh, definitely go check it out. Um, uh, Larry Keys is saying I have a great five mag deep well imager base. Weighs two hundred pounds. Five. That's, mag deep well imager base yeah okay. that's a that's a lot to carry around lugging yeah. 200 pounds around i mean i'm sure you know you can get phenomenal images with big systems you really can but uh there it takes a lot more um you know getting <laughs> getting up the will to pack the car with that yeah and go somewhere with it is, well we've talked yeah we've talked about that in the past with with telescope talk is you need a sturdy, well-designed mount for imaging. Actually, you you could use you need one period, but it's really important yeah. in imaging. Uh, Galaxia wants to know how long the exposure times were for your the helix. exposure times on. I'm sorry, on the long on exposure the, on the helix. Yeah, yeah, those were thirty minute subs each. Thirty minutes each. And what camera did you use? Uh, in my observatory, um, and that's that's another one of the projects we're working on. I can talk about in just a second, but. In Observatory One, we have a, an S Big 16803, so it's a medium format CCD, really big chip. It's basically like think of a full frame DSLR. It's that size and a half, so it's big. And uh, yeah, but we have it on a really long focal length system, so we're trying to shoot some high res stuff with it. Okay, so S Big stands for Santa Barbara Instrument Group, and they are a manufacturer of astronomy cameras, CCD right. cameras, not CMOS detectors, which uh, I think is better. Uh, and those are amazing cameras. Uh, they are absolutely wonderful. They're professional quality. I mean, they're actually installed in many professional ground-based observatories, and so they are. We sell them to NASA all the time. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. The yeah. pro the the real issue now with 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 uh, cameras these days is is a lot of pro professional astronomers want detectors that are better in the infrared than a lot of the ones that you can get commercially. But the ones that you get commercially yeah. are really good for what they do, and they are professional grade. So. Um, yeah. Wow. So that means that you had to cool that camera and you had to worry about dark current, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, you did. Well, let me let me touch on something you just said. So you said the infrared and it's funny because that's been really hot recently. It's funny that you you noticed that. <laughs> no pun on, intended, on right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it uh it has. I mean, we are seeing a lot of people so we do custom coatings for people and we've had so many uh people looking for gold-plated mirrors instead of the typical you know reflectivity they need the gold so that they can reach into the ir and um yeah it's been very interesting watch gold is yeah rise. in fact the jwst um uh space telescope has got gold on its primary mirror because it is highly reflective in the yeah, yeah. infrared so uh, really so well, there's people cool. coming to you wanting gold plated mirrors for this we reason we do it all the time so you see these big telescopes rolling down the hall with completely gold mirrors it's amazing wow wow yeah. And these are just people, or are they professional institutes? It's mostly uh, professionals. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, the I'm reason saying. I say that is that there is it's it's very difficult to just do infrared astronomy anywhere. Uh, there's yeah. very few places on Earth where it is ideal. Uh, among them is where they're building all the professional observatories, things like Mauna Kea right. and then the Andes of, of Chile. All uh -huh. of these mountains are are picked because they have very low water vapor in the atmosphere at those at those altitudes and that's because it, there are it absorbs infrared um, at right. certain wavelengths. Water vapor does. So I'm curious. I'm, I'm 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 amazed that there are people just coming to you and saying, "Hey, we want some. We want you to build us an infrared telescope." That's really yeah. Cool. We do it all the time. And where do you where scopes. do you get the detectors from? Do you do you uh, do you or do they get them somewhere else? Because those are specialized, aren't they? 
Uh, they are. And so some of it we can talk about. We do a lot with the DOD as well. So some of it we can't. But uh, yeah, I mean, it is very highly specialized. And, um, you know, the the mirrors themselves, so they go all the way up. So people started with like six inch scopes. We did a lot of six inch gold. But now, I mean, we're seeing 16 and 20 that people are wanting, you know, so it's, it's working and they're going everywhere. But, you know, SSA and all of these things have really changed the game. So space situational awareness. Um, and just people kind of uh, what? pushing the space, bounds. Space situational awareness. What do you mean? Yeah. Oh, so that's new to you. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, it's a huge thing. Um, you know, a lot of companies like SpaceX, we deal a lot with them. They are putting up these these rockets, right. um, you know, all the time. And they need to know where everything is at all times and how the things that are already up there are doing. So, SSA has become an industry on its own, which is mainly people... Uh, you know, watching all the time and they're just tracking. So they build these observatory, uh, basically like nets. They're, they're everywhere, all over the planet. And uh, they're watching things all the time. And then if something goes wrong, they've got the data. So they might have 100 observatories watching different satellites all the time, right? And they're just kind of looking for different things. Like if a satellite maybe explodes, they need to know where did all of that junk go? Because now you've got an 18,000 mile an hour missile you know, missile that was just a bolt a few seconds before that could bring a rocket down. I did not know that. So I guess I do have to have cameras kind of pointing everywhere and, and looking yeah. all over the place. Wow, that's yeah, really cool. All the time. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, it's, just, it's just something, I guess when you look at a SpaceX launch, I mean, they, they do the best I've ever seen at showing you what's going on outside the rocket for as long as they can do the telemetry. And that's really cool. So, of course, they've got to have cameras outside their rocket and, and point at all kinds of places to make sure things deploy the way they're supposed right. to. That's really cool. Superluminal yep. wants to know what your opinions are on open tube versus clo closed tube Cassegrain uh, telescopes. For example, Vixen VMC 200L, the Takahashi Mulan and versus Mead Celestron Schmidt Cassegrains. Yeah, so opinions? if, well, do becomes a problem for a lot of the systems if they are, say, like trust designs. Uh, you know, do can become a problem. So I'm from Tennessee originally. So it was, you had an hour, you know, you had an hour to get it, get your imaging in before do would just absolutely, it was almost like rain, you know? And so uh, a lot of those, it's, it's better to have a closed system if you can, if you're in a, you know, an area where that's going to be an issue. But other than that, I mean, the trust designs are so stable and strong, even up to the, like, we saw one meter telescopes fairly regularly, and those are trust designs. And, uh, I mean, you can hang off those things, and they're not moving, you know. And same thing with, like, the plane wave. That thing, you, there's no twisting it. There's no, they're, they're solid. So, it really, what comes, what comes into play is, for a trust design, or anything that's open, is keeping, or even just a, cas a Smith Cassegrain, where you have an element on the front, or refractive element on the front you have to think about can you keep dust off that element can you keep dust out of the truss right out of the tube itself and can you keep dew and can you keep stray light so if you can do all of that then there's really no benefit one way or the other yeah i think the when you're thinking about like when i when i imagine that i think between open and closed tube uh, dobsonians and it would to me it would just come through the weight factor i think it'd be lighter to move yeah. around you might be able to collapse a dobsonian without with a with a truss tube like those light bridge uh telescopes uh you yeah. could collapse those down better maybe fit them in your car things like that but you're right stray light yeah. becomes the biggest issue uh with with those two kind of tubes uh um, right Let's see. There was a question about shipping things to Australia, and I can't seem uh -huh. to find it now. But uh, you guys do ship to Australia, right? All over the world. Yeah, we yeah. ship things just about every day to Australia. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I can't see the exact comment, but he's like trying to get oh. a, a specific. I'll, I'll, I'll keep scrolling through and, and see if I can find it. Eureka yeah. Roberto, spending a lot on a scope isn't worth it. When you live in a big city, I've gotten some amazing photos and videos of the moon using a 70 millimeter and a good smartphone. Mm -hmm. So, yes, absolutely. And that's uh, that's one of the things I'm most excited about that we're working on. But we shot last year from Times Square, New York City. So wherever you are, it's probably not brighter than that. 
right? And uh, <laughs> that's true. The, <laughs> the, the whole idea was to show that using filters, you can cut right through it. And we did. And we're actually going to be doing that. So we're going to be shooting from LA. We're shooting from Times Square again. When we're traveling to these big, bigger cities, uh, we're going to be shooting from all of the major cities right through the lights using narrowband filters, which are super narrow filters that basically like if you isolate wavelengths like hydrogen alpha, since the street lamp itself isn't putting off anything in that wavelength, you cut right through it. And so most of the imaging I've done has actually been from downtown in cities. And uh, I love that because it, it takes away one of the very difficult requirements of, you know, of astronomy is getting out to a dark site, especially if you're on the East Coast in the United States. It's very, very hard to find. I mean, look at a light pollution map. The whole thing is just lit up. Anything yeah. east of the Mississippi River, it's a nightmare yeah. trying to find a dark sky. And so with narrowband filters and specifically the triad filter, which is the newest one, it has uh, three or four. We have two different versions, uh, basically passes through one filter. You can shoot even color cameras. So you can shoot like a DSLR right through a street lamp and it's fine. It's unbelievable. Now, what are we talking about sodium vapor lamps or any kind of street lamp? What about the LED yeah. lamps? Are they filterable? LEDs are tough. LEDs yeah. are tough, but we're seeing more and more that most cities are kind of putting a stop to that going everywhere and trying to control that. Uh, you know, the um, Dark Sky Network does mm -hmm. a great job, or Dark Sky Association. I yep, think. yep, International yeah. Dark Sky Association. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do a phenomenal job of bringing awareness to cities and, and making it uh, making them slow down on putting that everywhere. But uh, yeah, I mean, you can put these filters on, and if they're narrow enough, you're you're cutting right through most of the problem. Okay. Well, uh, I found the comment. It was James Dugan, and he goes, "Can OPT sell me a Celestron CGX mount and ship it to Australia? My dealer is very expensive. So is that it? That is something if you carry it, you can do right." Uh, so we do have some limitations. I don't know on that specifically. I can, uh, I can absolutely. Well, would the website do it if they, if he went through the motions yeah. on the website? It'd tell, if you go it'd tell. through, yeah, if you go through the website, it'll say restricted if you try to buy it. Um, so okay. we do have some restrictions where there's already dealers there that we work with and we don't want to, you know, step on toes. And that's oh, I thing. see. So there's, but, there can be that issue. I see what you mean. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So give it a try, James, and see what it says on the website. Um, and, and then most products yes there are certain brands where things uh you know where we've set up agreements we won't go into certain territories but most products on the website of twenty thousand SKUs, you're only going to find a handful that can't go into your area uh, okay so yeah john suffle just commented in the uk all the sodium lights are being replaced by white leds nothing you can do to filter that out so yeah james yeah, Dugan says rough. it's near four thousand dollars for him to get that uh in australia i guess that's in australian dollars um so yeah okay well um so let's let so let's talk about some of the observatories that you have set up you've already mentioned sure. now anybody who's followed fraser kane and i know a lot of you do uh watch a lot of fraser kane's videos and he is live he has been live streaming on twitch using uh the opt's um uh, remote telescopes and uh, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about what those telescopes are designed to do and why you built them and uh, how they can watch somebody use them or maybe even use them sure. themselves yeah this was kind of a, a dream for our company you know everybody here is very passionate about this idea but um, I grew up in Alabama so before Tennessee that's where I spent my entire childhood essentially is in Alabama and uh we never had an astronomy class. We never, I never saw a telescope until I was in college, you know, and thinking about that now, it's, it's pretty ridiculous that that's the case. When you, when you consider that all the things I did see, and I never saw a telescope, right? But the idea was, why don't we build these remote observatories so that we don't have to ask anybody to have anything other than, say, a cell phone, right? And which most people have anyway. We'll build these remote observatories in different dark sky locations around the world, and then we'll just give them away. We'll give away the time. And uh, we started as a project. It was just a passion project, but it just it worked. So we've built six so far. We're going to build them in every time zone around the world. That's the plan that has land in it, at least that we can. And um, so that no matter when you're shooting, it's dark somewhere on the planet and we can have people logging in. And like you were saying with Fraser, uh, what we do is we have virtual star parties. And so uh, you, you know, the last one I think had 8,000 people logged in at once and they're just typing, hey, I wanna see the Veil Nebula. And so they can watch 
in real time, the telescope moving in the observatory. And this is, you know, Fraser's in Canada. I'm in San Diego area. And then the scope is all the way out in Joshua Tree, out in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And so he's controlling it. I'm communicating with people. And um, whatever they want to see, they can watch the scope move and start showing live images of whatever it was, you know, that whatever target they wanted to see. And so that's how the systems work. And we're trying to take it to the next level, which is not even have to have somebody driving. Let whoever wants to take pictures, take their own photos. So anyone listening right now could log in. We have one in Texas that's about to go live. That is this idea. So you just go on reserve time. And then that telescope for that time is yours to control. And we've really simplified the process to where there's basically two two boxes, which one is, where do you want to go? And the second one is, how many, uh, how many images do you want to take and for how long? And if you fill those in, you're taking images and you can see them coming in live. And so, yeah. I, I think awesome. that is the future of what you're doing. These, uh, what you're describing, with, in the, at least in Texas, maybe not the one in Joshua Tree, but the one in Texas, you're describing what people have been doing in the professional realm for quite a while. Apache Point comes to mind. These are robotic telescopes. These are telescopes right. where nobody is there, but there is an observing program on that night of the things that are going to be observed. So if I don't, if I understand what you just said, somebody will say, well, log into the system, say right. what they want an image of, and then that would get put into a program, presumably, exactly. for that observing yeah. night. And then it would, and then you're somewhere it would tell you an alert would go out that says your images can be downloaded here. Uh, exactly and get them that is a very professional that is how professional astronomy works now folks this is that yeah. is that is exactly what they do sometimes well not sometimes a lot of times astronomers still go to the observatory like i went to the blanco four meter in chile uh to get observations oh, i didn't need to be there but right. i was there uh just so i could get my data and take it home right away uh instead of because the internet back in the mid 2000s was pretty slow so um so, but that has all changed, and that is going to be, I think, the wave of the future. A lot, if, if if you get a lot of these Dustin set up such that they're easy to use, and they they the quality of the uh, 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 optics and the 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 telescope and the tracking and all of that kind of stuff, man, that's just going to make all kinds of things possible because you got to kind of know how to use this stuff anyway to tell it. To, you, I suppose, you're going to have it say, "I want to see M31." But wouldn't it be great if you could say, I want to observe this Cepheid variable over 10 nights. And then right. this, this person could maybe do his own science fair project. A student could do their own science fair project on Cepheid yeah. variables um, or, or you know, try to measure a type 1A supernova or something like that. That would be right. really amazing. So I really think so. We're trying to get there. You know, the problem is it hasn't been done in that way. And so a lot of it we're having to develop in house and it just takes time. But mm -hmm. I can tell you, you know, we're talking about it every day. Like I said, we've got six of them running now. And so we've got people all over the world logging in regularly. We let people from Instagram log in and take control of it. Um, and so it works. It's just now we have to really simplify it so that it's not just can be done, but is fun and user friendly. And that's, that's and the scalable. point right now. That's uh, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's, it's beating us up a little bit, but you know, we're going to get there and uh, I'm excited. I'm excited. Yeah. That you're yeah. have that kind of access to the universe. So you now know? you're going to, you're going to train me on how to use one of these someday. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, I need ideas folks. What do we want to do with these telescopes? Because uh, we already have a virtual star party, but uh, it would, I, I would like to do some educational things with it. I'd like to do some actual uh, amateur, I mean, um, citizen science with it in some way. So think mm -hmm. up, think up stuff, folks. We can get access to these telescopes uh, and and use them in, in a variety of ways. I'm trying to get Dustin to build one. He said every time zone. Well, I live in the eastern time zone. And yeah, okay, so in the summertime we have crappy skies. But in the wintertime, I'm here to tell you, Dustin, it's pretty good. We got a lot yeah. of clear nights good. down here. I have five, good. Acres, good. Of what I I have five acres of land. It's yeah. beautiful down here. Just well, like, you're going to walk outside in your driveway one day and see a 20 foot dome sitting there. I'm just like, <laughs> assemble it. Yes. Assemble it. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. I'll, I'll, I'm up for it. Yeah, test Good. me. Test me on that, Dustin. I, I dare you. I will absolutely get you gear. Right there. I, want to, I want to see this stuff coming in. With narrowband filters, I mean, it doesn't matter if the, the skies are great or not. As long as you're not cloudy, you're good. That's right. That's right. And, uh, and the, the, we're coming up. This is the Central Florida. Uh, the observing season is starting now. And uh, already the Central right. Florida uh, amateur clubs are already 
gearing up for a lot of cool uh, events and stuff. So, yes. You know, and that's that's one exciting project that uh, we're working on with you here, but we should probably dive into some of them because think about, I mean, we've got a list of projects that are all on that scale, you know, of fun things that are coming up. I mean, we've got the City Lights Imaging Project I talked about where we're shooting from all these cities and inviting everyone. So it's outreach events in major cities. So you live in the New York area or anywhere close, come hang out with us in Times Square and shoot through major telescopes, you know, or huge telescopes and talk to the major brands and all these things. Um, So that sort of thing. We've got uh, our own space telescope going up. And I, I feel like I still can't believe that's a sentence I'm saying, but it's true. Uh, OPT is partnered with Space Fab, and uh, we have a space telescope going up. Yeah, And that's, again, controlled by consumers. Just anyone that wants to use it can log in and control this their own space telescope. I know. I can't believe that. I it, it, yeah. uh, It's yeah, what's the what, what's the website? Do you remember it's spacefab dot something? It's not dot com. Spacefab dot us dot us. That's what it is. Go there, folks. Yeah. Check it out. They yeah. it is a CubeSat, and yeah, they're gonna I'll bring put, it in to show people. Yeah, yeah, it's eight inch telescope orbiting in space for you. Yeah, you log in with your cell phone, point it at something, or point it back at Earth. You know, take the world's most technologically advanced selfie. <laughs> but, you know you know they're gonna do that don't you i mean oh absolutely <laughs> it was the first thing that uh when i was talking to the ceo over there at space fab is the first thing he said he's like you know what kind of images we're going to get coming to this thing we're not going to want to see them yeah. <laughs> it's, that's all right that's all right is this is this needs to exist let's make it exist you know but yeah we've already gotten the slots on uh two falcon nine rockets i mean this thing's going up so I am absolutely going to be all over this. I, I can't believe what a great opportunity this is and what a great idea it is yeah. to do. Uh, I still can't. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I lost an employee over this. I told him, I was like, cause we have, we have very little turnover. When you come into an industry like this, it's like, you're here because you are just as obsessed as we are. And you love this stuff. It's like you said, you went to Chile yeah. to see a scope, you know, I mean, it's a true, it gets in your blood, yeah. you know? And, and so we had a guy and he's like, Oh, I just don't, I can't leave. And he didn't for a long time, but I was like, he, you know, we, we have a lot of astrophysicists on staff and he was one of them. And he's like, I, uh, he's like, I built something in my garage and uh, we're putting it on a space telescope. I was like, wait, like, <laughs> what are we talking about right now? Is this this real conversation? He's like, yeah, but he's like, I just, I think it's time that I got to just devote all my time to this. I was like, absolutely. Get out of here. Go build this thing. And we're a hundred percent behind it. Let's do it. And that was probably a year and a half ago. And now here we are, we've got the prototype built. Uh, I can bring it in and show it on here. And uh, this thing is flying. It's got a lot of backing now. It was successful in the funding and this thing's flying. Yeah, it's really going up. So spacefab.us, go check out their website, folks. Uh, when, what, do you have any, is there a, is there a launch date or any kind of schedule yet? Or so is it, too it soon? was supposed to be late 2019, but it looks like it got delayed because of scheduling stuff for 2020, early 2020 is what it's looking like. So this isn't far away, folks, and it's no. going up on SpaceX, a SpaceX rocket, and uh, something that's been tried and true, so I don't see a lot of issues there. Um, wow, that's well, just... It, because it's ours, we're just going to show it off all the time. So we're going to let people, it's going to be all over social media. It's not going to be one of these things that's hidden in a garage somewhere, you know, or in uh, some like secret building. This thing's going to be everywhere. Like I said, I'll bring it in here and show people, let them see the, the inner workings of it. And this thing's amazing. Again, you know, I, I know it's going to be great to stuff like for having stuff like these remote telescopes, remote observatories on the ground, as well as the space telescope in orbit to take pretty pictures i get that that's a big draw but i'm telling you now what gets me the most excited i mean we've i've seen pretty pictures what gets me the most excited about this kind of thing is the ability for the average person who might have a good scientific question to ask to have the tools to be able to answer them and i think that's huge and i think that kind of tool yeah. without spending much money any money really i mean they're right. charging for telescope time on space fab but right. yeah. they well, we have to right because it's not that's yeah. the big deal it but, costs a little bit more to put something in orbit. But let's say, you know, let's say these, these, these you know, the, the ground-based telescopes that you're building like Texas and these things, uh, you're making them available to people. Are you charging Absolutely. for telescope time on these, by the way? No, no, okay. no. It's, we're not going to charge. There's no plan to charge. We're trying. I mean, the whole point is to make space accessible to everyone. So, <laughs> so what we're planning to build very, very high-end systems for people to use for absolutely nothing, for free. 
and what what can you remind me what telescopes are on these are in these sites? So one of them is a 17 inch plane wave um, on a massive plane wave mount. Uh, we have a 14 inch plane wave. We have a Celestron Rasa. We have a 10 inch RC TPORC. Um, Hindren is using Chris Hindren, the guy I was talking about earlier, is using an ODK, uh, which is uh, kind of like a, a plane wave, but uh, Orion Optics UK. So an ODK 10 inch and a Pentax refractor on top of it. And then we've got a Takahashi Epsilon on another one. So super fast systems, big systems, small systems, everything. Okay. We're about to build another one with a planetary system and a solar system. I guess that sounds weird when I say and these like have, that. A solar these, imaging system. Yeah, and these have <laughs> these have uh, filter wheels on them and things like that too, right? So it's got everything you can possibly imagine, all the way down to adaptive optics. You know, well, at least the, the type we sell, not sodium lasers, but you know, the AO units that come through for the amateurs. I mean, what a resource! That's, I mean, that that is something that that if if if, if that doesn't get your blood boiling about wanting to get underneath uh, the the night sky and start seeing what's up there and learning <laughs> things, I don't know what will. There's there's no excuse now, folks. You may not have money. You may not be able to buy the best telescope in the world, but you don't have to. These resources are available to you now uh, in ways that I think are are going to be changing all everybody's view of getting into science and STEM education, all kinds of things. So I'm very, very psyched about that. Um, well, think about it, man. I mean, we're seeing things that no humans in all of human history have seen before our generations, right? The living generations now, no humans have ever seen this in human history. And we're doing it not only for fun, we can do it for free, and we can see things, see further into places that are completely unexplored and just, I mean, take this to an entirely new level. If it's not exciting, I mean... I don't. I don't even know what to say. Right? You're dead. If you if you're not excited yeah. about this, you're just dead. Yeah. That's the way it goes down. Because exactly. this is what it's all about, folks. Looking up. Right. You know, one of the things about science that everybody taught, you know, that everybody says is so great is that well, you know, these um, it needs to be reproducible. We need to be able to reproduce observations or reproduce uh, experiments to prove what we know about the universe. And really, it's very difficult to do without specialized equipment. And in the case of astronomy and things like, well, you know, type 1A supernovae, I keep coming back to because, you know, people are wondering if what they know about type 1A supernovae are true or not. And, and one of the problems is lack of data. Imagine providing data on your observations like curves that you took of type right. 1, even discovering your own type 1A supernova uh, yeah. that no one has ever seen before. Uh, these are things that are now open to just regular people who have the drive to use and understand these telescopes. So the tools are finally being put in your hands. And I think this is probably the most exciting thing I've gotten involved in in a long time. So um, I really, I really want to um, emphasize that you should learn more through us, both of us, both, both Dustin and I are going to be telling you all about this stuff in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely keep going. Um, and that's what I think made this, you know, when we first started talking about that, that's what I think made this such a, a great uh, pairing is that I know that you're absolutely fascinated and you're in love with the science aspect. And I think it's it's extremely interesting. And I end up spending a lot of my time, you know, especially with Fraser and Pamela Gay, uh, hearing things that just absolutely blow my mind. And I love hearing it. But I'm a photographer at heart. And so that's the side that appeals to me is I love the pretty images. I love seeing people, you know, all the time I help people take their first image. And, you know, a few months later, they're taking images that blow mine away. Yeah. Nothing makes me happier, you know, and I love seeing this stuff produced that, I, you know, people are taking it to another level. And it's exciting that this can become not just scientific, but an art form where people are, you know, they're taking stuff that most people have never seen and instead making it these art forms. I mean, and, and inspiring people to do more. It's, it's unbelievable. It really yeah, is. I don't mean to uh, knock at all the pretty pictures that the people, I mean, they are amazing and they are wondrous. Um, but what I, what I love is when I see uh, data that I've never seen before. And, sure, absolutely. And, and so that to me is what, what turns my crank. But abs I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope has probably been the single most important uh, uh, purveyor of that kind of feeling where we look at these, you know, the pillars of creation or the Orion Nebula or M31 in a ways that we, you know, the only Hubble can show. It, it really right. is a humbling and, and awe-inspiring thing. So, 
Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think pretty pictures are great. I, I think the, the pretty pictures give that, that science, uh, the context necessary to really understand yes. its place. And, you know, and that's, that's another thing that we're doing. So we have those, those ultra high res projects we're doing where we're starting super wide field with medium format and just camera lenses saying, if you walk out your door this time of night, this is what West looks like. And then we have a medium size system that's shooting at a slightly tighter field of view. And it's like, okay, this is what the constellation looks like. And then we have the plane wave shooting just the target in super high resolution saying, you know, this is what the Lagoon Nebula looks like, or this is what, you know, the Whirlpool Galaxy looks like. And so it really gives it context. So from going from, you know, walking out your front door to seeing a specific spot in space and knowing this is what's there. This is where those new stars are being born. This is where, you know, all of this chaos is happening or whatever it is that we're talking about. It gives it context. Yes. And I have to ask you this question, Dustin, because sure. John Suffle has been reminding me since before this hangout started. I need to ask you sure. what what it, where is the what is the cheapest um, four inch doublet refractor uh, that you what of, of the of the scopes that you sell? What's the cheapest four inch refractor doublet? Uh, the cheapest four inch doublet. Wow. Uh, that's, that's difficult to top of my head. I have, I have one sitting here. That's good timing. <laughs> um, yeah. So it might actually be this one. Um, it's probably very close. So this is an explore scientific, um, uh, ED 102. And yeah, I think that this, this would be close, but you know, for four inch doublets, you really don't have to get super invested and they are phenomenal scopes getting started. Can you give me uh, a, a price range, roughly what they cost? Oh man, I, I don't, don't know, know off the top of my, I mean, you're under a thousand dollars easy, okay. like, uh, but I don't know off the top of my head. And, okay. um, you know, and so even, even Apos, you know, the 70 millimeter Apos are under a thousand dollars now. You can get those for like seven or 800 bucks. And that's, you know, that's what most of the staff is using. They love those things. Cause yeah, they're so affordable. I, I, but those, those look but yeah, good. four inch doublet. I mean, that's a phenomenal telescope. Are those so, wide field? It looked like from the focal length. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Most refractors you see are going to be wide field. Okay. Well, that didn't used to be true. A lot of times the smaller refractors had very narrow fields because they had such long focal mm -hmm. lengths. But right. I guess the, right, for sure. these days they're, they're better. He goes, the reason I ask is I have an Optic Star 4-inch doublet that costs less than 200 pounds and was wondering if the same telescope is available in the States, maybe under another name. Optic Star. Optic Star. I'm not familiar with Optic Star, so I don't. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised because you see that a lot, um, where the same or very similar telescopes are sold under different names, uh, you know, in different countries. But I, I honestly couldn't tell you, and I don't want to give the wrong information. Okay. Superlumina wants to know what ultra, uh, what UHC filter do you recommend for visual? Um, ultra high contrast, I guess, is what that means, right? Yeah. So um, you know, I don't. I don't do a ton of visual. We have uh, an entire team here that, that recommends the visual stuff. Let me see here. I can go to what they've got. Give me just a moment. Uh, most of the stuff I do is, is imaging, and so I always get behind on the visual stuff. Okay. Uh, let me just, while you're looking that up real quick, I'll just say that um, uh, Raj Luther is asking, can the equipment be purchased outside the U.S.? I live in England. Yes, uh, we talked about that earlier, Raj. They ship anywhere in the world. There are some restrictions on some things, and the way to find out what those are is basically go through the order process on the website. Um, I think it's OPT Corp, right? Um, dot com. OPT Corp dot com. Yeah. yeah, and then you can uh, and then you can go through the process, and it'll tell you. Sometimes they're restricted because of agreements or other reasons why they can't ship to certain areas. But that's how you find out, Raj. Right. In England, I'm sure would have quite a few. Um, uh, uh, opportunities to get things to you because that's a pretty you know, i don't unless unless there's certain specific things i don't know about um, and so there's a there's a kind of a trick on our website so uh, i'm looking at the different filters here now but if you go to our website and if you have any questions about any filters at all because they do look the same on paper and they're not but if you go to the filters you can actually filter down in those pages and it will show you which filters are most popular to our customers and, uh, you know, for each type. So like on the filter page, you can select, I just want visual filters. I just want UHC filters. And it will show you which ones customers are buying most often. Or, or you know, I just want contrast. I just want color filters, whatever it is. It will show you which brands and which filter are most popular with our customers and give you reviews. Cool. All right. 
Um, okay, so uh, I had another question and it just escaped my mind. But for but for now, um, I guess we'll we'll just um, uh, well we we've been at this about an hour anyway. So yeah. is there anything else we want to bring up before we before we head out? You know, I think uh, we're going to be doing this a lot, right? So, I mean, we could fill 50 of these things with all the stuff we have going on. But uh, why don't we just save the rest for the next one? Okay. So, uh, so Dustin will be back for more Telescope Talks. And we're going to be also doing a podcast. I didn't get any input on that, folks. So, let me know uh, in all the various uh, social media channels that I'm on what kind of podcast you'd like to, you'd like to see us do. Um, we're definitely going to be talking about telescopes for sure, but we also want to mix it up and, and, and make it a much more appealing to a wider audience kind of podcast. So if you don't say anything, we're going to just start doing stuff <laughs> and seeing what yeah. works. So, um, so anyway, I'm very excited to be working with OPT. I think this is going to be a great partnership together. We'll be, you'll, you'll be seeing a lot more content, uh, especially as things like with, with the remote telescopes, I'm going to be playing with those ideas. We're going to be making videos together, podcast and, and, and streaming all the time. So, uh, look for a lot of, let us know what you'd like to see. We have a resource now with OPT that we didn't have before. And so I'm excited to, to see what's possible. So Thanks, hey, we're Justin. excited to have Justin. you, man. And uh, yeah, let's get everybody involved. Everybody here listening, let's just get everyone involved. Let's uh, play with some telescopes, you know. Let's do it. This is fun stuff. All right. Okay, yeah. guys. Well, you guys have a uh, – Dustin, I hope your, the rest of your move goes well. And uh, we will well, – I guess we'll be in touch sometime next week, and we'll talk about more stuff. And uh, we'll hopefully um, get started on that podcast real soon. So. Have Sounds good, good to me. Have, have a good weekend, and thanks for taking time out to talk to us all about right. all the stuff you guys are doing, or I Absolutely. guess we're doing. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. Absolutely. All right. Thank Sounds you all good. so much for watching. And on behalf of Dustin uh, uh, Gibson from OPT Telescopes, my name is Tony Darnell, and uh, thank you for watching. And as always, keep looking.